So welcome, welcome to the March Jug. Java news. There was a lot of news this month. We'll try to go quickly so Martin doesn't run out of time. Uh, the Java 1 2015 call for proposals is open until April 26th. You should submit something because you get a free pass worth thousands of dollars. All you have to do is fly yourself there, which is just a minor detail. Um, <laughs> and find a hotel. And find a hotel. Book it now. <laughs> Book the hotel before you submit your paper, actually. Too late, and already <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Java One's a lot of fun. It's the biggest Java conference. Happens annually. And you should go. If you haven't gone, you should go, because it's, it's a lot of fun to be there, a lot of fun to learn all the things. Don't go. Yeah, and don't, yeah, don't stay in the Tenderloin, because that's a, a <laughs> one of the sketchier parts of North America. All right, Java SE 8 update 40 came out since our last meeting. It's a big release. Uh, they had a lot of uh, enhancements to the Packager tool, which you can use. It's now like built in part of the JDK. You can make your application a self-contained executable on various platforms. Um, they added a bunch of features to it in this update. Like uh, you can now pass command line arguments through the wrapper into your main class. Uh, you can register for file associations in whatever OS you're in. So when you double click a file with a particular extension name, it opens your app. Um, you can even, from inside of your app, inside the wrapper, set JVM options that will be used next time your app is restarted, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, you can have multiple entry points and multiple icons uh, share the same app package, which is good too. Uh, Nashorn saw a bunch of performance improvements that we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, JavaFX got a new rendering pipeline for OS X that is App Store approved. The old one was apparently based on QuickTime, which Apple flags and doesn't allow you to put an app in the App Store if you use that API because it's deprecated. So the new JavaFX is good to go for the App Store. And like dozens of other things that I couldn't fit here. Uh, so about the Nashorn performance, there was a good blog on that URL there, it spans three lines. Um, it had some really good specific tips if you are running JavaScript workloads in your JVM about how to make them go faster uh, with tuning parameters, but also just it, there's enough explanation along with all the tuning parameters that not only will you learn something about making JavaScript go faster in the JVM, but might get some hints about how to make your own stuff go faster that has nothing to do with that. So worth a read. Uh, Java 9 work is underway. Project Coin is making a reappearance again. Uh, this time, just a bunch of really small things. It's even more focused than previous versions of Project Coin, meaning uh, it, that's like a pun for small change, is where that name came from. Uh, you can have safe var args on instance methods of something. I don't think I finished that sentence, sorry. Um, you can use try with resources with effectively final variables. You don't have to declare them inside the parentheses anymore, which is kind of neat. Um, you can use the diamond operator with anonymous classes. So type inference works uh, even if you don't name your type. The underscore, which was a warning in Java 8, will become a perfectly non-legal identifier in Java 9. That's been done. And um, some work that just got committed, uh, I think, last week to the JDK 9 project is that uh, you can now have private instance methods on interfaces, which lets your default methods share code. So that's kind of neat. That was apparently considered for Java 8, but pulled out because of time constraints. And the, the full explanation is there on the, on the Jira URL at the bottom. Groovy has found a new home at the Apache Software Foundation. We reported last month they were looking for a foundation, so they found one. They're going to go with Apache. They're starting as an incubator project, which all projects do, just sorting out legal things and procedural things, and they'll eventually graduate to a top-level Apache project. Google code hosting is going away. I had a handful of projects there. So uh, as of Mar uh, the 12th of this month, you can no longer create a new project on Google Code. 
the site's going to be read-only starting August 24th of this year. Uh, it won't have a UI anymore uh, starting January 25th next year. And I'll, if you go to a project page, you'll just be offered to download a tarball of the data that was associated with that project. And even that is going away at the end of next year. So if you have a Google Code project, go there and press the export to GitHub button and type in your GitHub password and you'll be all safe. I did that today. It was painless. So. And finally, there's a developer survey just of people who develop software. And if you go and fill it out, you can inflate the importance of Java in the results. So <laughs> do that, or Scala, whatever flavor of JVM things you like. On to the main talk with Martin. Cool, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about a Cloud Foundry tooling. Cloud Foundry, the platform as a service uh, that's open source and, and, and hosted by a foundation uh, created by VMware and Pivotal, but now there are a lot of, a lot of other companies working on this project as well, like IBM and, and other projects. The IBM Bluemix stuff, for example, is also based on Cloud Foundry. Um, I, will, I will just quickly go through and introduce you to the different ways um, that uh, you can use tooling and different tools to access stuff on Cloud Foundry, push your apps, work with Cloud Foundry. Um, and I will rush you through some live demos about using the command line interface for Cloud Foundry, uh, using the Eclipse plugin that my team is building. So I'm working from home in Germany and the team that's doing these XYZ integrations for Eclipse. Uh, uh, Spring integration for Eclipse, Cloud Foundry integration for Eclipse, Aspect J integration for Eclipse, that's done in my team. And in the end, um, I will quickly show you um, uh, Eclipse Orion, which is a web-based IDE that has also a connection to Cloud Foundry. So running in and running a, creating a node app on, on the web uh, and pushing that app to Cloud Foundry from the web, from the browser only. Uh, that's a plan, a uh, pretty aggressive plan for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, but I will, I will do my best. Uh, and I don't want to bore you with slides, so I will just switch over to live coding and stuff like that. Hope that's fine with you. So forget about the slides. Okay, so is that okay? Can you see that? Okay. Uh, I have a Spring Boot application uh, here, which is a simple Spring Boot application uh, providing a REST service. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, it's, it's, it's a very basic, basic Spring Boot app using Spring, uh, a controller uh, serving hello from Cloud Foundry CLI. Uh, and the easiest way to get, uh, get this app on Cloud Foundry from the command line is there's a command line tool. Uh, it's called CF, and you can do CF login. I hope that the network is working out here, but it was pretty good. Maybe. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I put in my credentials for Cloud Foundry. Um, this is the, um, the hosted version um, from Pivotal. Uh, which you can you can just use. So you can create a, an, an account, and that's free for 60 days. After that, you have to pay for for whatever you're using on on Cloud Foundry on the on the public version. Um, I choose a space, so I'm I'm logged in here. I can use the command line to see okay what apps are being deployed on Cloud Foundry at the moment in this space. Plenty of apps being deployed, um, so that's good. I could could dig into some details, for example, CF app, what's this ML, ML REST service. Take a look at the details, see, okay, there it, it started, there's one instance running, consuming some memory, some disk space, um, the memory constraints, one instance, that, that looks fine. Okay, but I would like to push my app, so I would like to deploy my app. Um, so what I can do is run a Maven build, which I did before. Uh, so inside target, there is there's a final artifact, and Spring Boot takes care of putting all the dependencies into one big job file. So it is some kind of a self-contained job file in this case. It's a Spring Boot app, a JVM, Java app, um, with an embedded Tomcat. Everything is inside, inside this jar. Uh, therefore, it's, it's such, a, uh, such a big job file. Uh, so what I can do now is I can go to uh, 
Cloud Foundry, to the Cloud Foundry command line tool and say, okay, I just push the app. And I don't care about these kind of uh, the routing and spinning up a JVM and creating the right JVM or whatever. It's all done by Cloud Foundry. So let's try to do that. I put in a name saying CF push. I push my app. The name should be uh, MLCFCLI demo. And that's my job file that I would like to push. So I'm uploading gigabytes now over the network. Hope that that works out. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> let's see what's, uh, what's going on. Oh, that seems to be OK. Um, so Cloud Foundry is taking the app, um, is um, creating a new execution agent for that on an Amazon, Amazon data center where Cloud Foundry is running. Um, and uh, looks into the app, tries to find out what, what kind of app is it. Oh, is it Spring Boot app? So I need to create a JDK. Need to create the right environment for that. Um, need to do some kind of magic Spring auto configuration so it connects your app to services that are inside the cloud if you would like to use those services. Uh, and it's uploading this, this, this piece into these execution agent on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and it now tries to, tries to start the app on Cloud Foundry. And it's running. It's there. So that, that's all I need to do to get my first Spring Boot app running on Cloud Foundry from the command line. Uh, and if I would like to take a look at that, I can just open up a web browser and put in this URL, and I get hello from CFCLI. That's it. That's live. Uh, and that's a, that's a public URL, right? So it's, uh, y you can all access that if you want now uh, and try to, try to get it down. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but in that case, not my fault, right? It's Cloud Foundry. No. Uh, it, it, so it's live, right? It, it's pushed to the Amazon Data Center where Cloud Foundry is running. Um, that, that's one way of getting your application onto Cloud Foundry. Of course, this is usually what's being used in the, in the deployment pipeline. So you have some kind of CI build. At the end of the CI build, there is some kind of a, a Maven extension that pushes your app automatically to Cloud Foundry. Um, or at the end of the build, at the end of the CI pipeline, however your exact setup looks like. Um, and you can do a lot of stuff from, from the command line. Uh, as you can see, there are thousands of commands where you can do more or less everything with Cloud Foundry. You can take a look at what are the running apps, what are the services. You can start, stop, re-push apps. You can update apps running on Cloud Foundry, all that stuff. That's great. OK. Um, but I'm a big fan of Eclipse, of course, and I like to develop stuff in Eclipse. So I would like to do something like that from Eclipse as well. So let me quickly log out here and jump to my Eclipse, which isn't a, a Spring tool suite. That's the stuff that we're building for, for making Spring, lives, uh, Spring developer lives easier. Um, and we have a Cloud Foundry integration for, for Eclipse. It allows you to create a Cloud Foundry uh, connection from the service view, like you would set up your local Tomcat or whatever. So you can say create new server, which is not really creating a new Cloud Foundry instance. It just creates the adapter, the connector, to connect you to some, some Cloud Foundry instances running somewhere. Uh, in this case, I would put in my credentials and say, OK, please target the public uh, hosted version from Pivotal. That's what I did. That's what's, what's here. And I can see all the information, like uh, organization space. But most importantly, I can take a look at the deployed applications um, and see what's on, what's on there. It's basically the same that I could do with a command line using CF apps. It would show me the list of apps. Now it shows me the list of apps. It shows me uh, the stuff that, that's in here. Uh, maybe if I, if I close it down. It also shows me the services in, the, in this area um, that are created for my space. And I can take a look at the deployed app. In this case, I also deployed this app here. So I can take a look at the details for this app. So this is the URL that this app is mapped to, the memory limit, all these, these nice little configurations that I can do. I can scale up the app, say, oh, yeah, let's run five instances of that. Uh, I can uh, stop, restart, update, restart, all those kind of things. I can even take a look, which, which is nice sometimes, um, 
at the at the files at the exact content of the stuff that's being deployed to Cloud Foundry so that I can take a look inside the stuff that's being deployed to Cloud Foundry with the remote systems explorer so that's it's integrated let's see if I can I can fetch some content uh, those are all the apps where is my app this this is uh, an app that I deployed a while ago so I can take a look okay this is all the stuff that Cloud Foundry put into the execution agent for my application extracted some stuff from the app for example like oh my classes and uh, and I could even even take a look at some of the files, right? If if I'm the app is producing additional files on the file system, some some additional log output, additional debug output, whatever, I could just double click here and it would open up an Eclipse, so I can directly see what's on what's inside the application running on Cloud Foundry. That's kind of good, um, but um, I, to be honest, I really hate to debug applications by reading log files uh, and doing this kind of, oh, system out, blah, 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 and then, oh, let's redeploy the app, and as you've seen, oh, wait a minute, or wait five minutes till the app is restarted, and, and, and clicking through it again and see what, oh, yeah, it's, it's giving it this output, oh, yeah, let's do some other output in there, doing the same stuff all over again. Um, so what we did uh, in the latest release, and that's kind of a, a better feature, or in, in beta stage here um, is that you can deploy an app in debug mode so you can deploy your app you have to put some some magic stuff in there that's not top secret but it's not not yet documented because it's a uh, not yet not yet final so it's, it's a bit slow and a bit hacky and a bit tricky and a bit buggy but uh, it shows shows you what we are trying to do on Cloud Foundry with the tooling for Eclipse uh, you can um, you can take a look at this app. It's it's a REST service. Let me quickly show something up here. A browser. Uh, no default URL is being served. Uh, okay, so it's a uh, it's an it's a REST endpoint. What I can do here is I can like, now connect the debugger to that application that's running inside of Cloud Foundry somewhere in some Amazon data center. And if everything plays out nicely, um, I will connect my Eclipse debugger and all my Eclipse debugging API and UI that I have inside of Eclipse to this running instance on Cloud Foundry. What if you scale up to like multiple instances? What happens? Uh, you, will, you will be connected to a random instance, uh, which doesn't make much sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's pretty much focused on, it's not for production usage where you scale up the application 10 times. Code, right? uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but so it's, it's, it's very much focused on, you have one instance and you get this one instance, uh, one instance up and connected. Uh, yeah, you need to start the JVM with the debug flags, but that's done by the Cloud Foundry plugin for you when you deploy the app in debug mode, it automatically adds the environment options to Cloud Foundry to start the app with debug flags. And then the JVM is being started in deb with debug, uh, debug information. Uh, okay, let's see. Mm, nothing is really showing up here, that's strange. Let's try again. Nothing in here. Connect to the debugger again. Let's see. Uh, as I said, it's beta version, right? It's uh, no no guarantees here, no guarantees. But I demoed that uh, three times today. I can promise you, to other guys, so it it, it works. Um, and it shows up there. You can set breakpoints, so you can basically do whatever you want with your Eclipse debugger, as if the application would run locally on your machine, basically, which is which is nice. So you can change variables, you can set breakpoints, you can step through. Uh, you, can, you can even change code if you want, which is very, a very limited option for the JVM because it allows you to change code just on these kind of the method implementation level kind of thing. And even in, on that level, it just allows you to not do random things. Uh, you cannot change inner classes and stuff like that. You can change the implementation of a method, that's all. Um, but 
that kind of that kind of code changes can be hot swapped even onto the application running on Cloud Foundry if I would get the connection now. Yeah, maybe later. I don't know. <coughs> trust me, trust me, <laughs> trust me. Uh, we we will come back to that later. Um, Let's see. Yeah, the application is still running. The application is running in, in debug mode. Uh, sometimes it's a bit bit flaky, uh, since the uh, the real the real hacky part of this is that Cloud Foundry. If Cloud Foundry deploys, whoo, there it is. Awesome. Uh, now we get everything. It's it's already suspended. That's uh, that's strange. Whatever. Um, the tricky part is that if you deploy an app to Cloud Foundry, it's being very much sandboxed into an execution agent. And you do not have access to the JVM and to the sandboxed app from the outside world. It's very much hidden inside of Cloud Foundry. It opens up a port for, ex for this mapped URL so that I can access the application from outside using the browser API putting in the URL, and then it gets routed to the application with a router from Cloud Foundry. But it doesn't open up random ports or you can do everything to, from connecting out from outside to the inside application. Therefore, it's not possible to connect the remote debugger to the inside JVM running on Cloud Foundry. Um, therefore, there's some, some magic uh, being put in there that allows you to start the JVM in debug mode and reverse proxy the, the, uh, the, the port out through some magic outbound service back to your remote debugging uh, API on, on Eclipse, which is kind of hacky and tricky. That's why it sometimes does not really work reliably and it's sometimes a bit slow. That will change in the future. So I think newer versions of Cloud Foundry will make it easier for us to connect to this application and to open up a specific channel for debugging. Um, but it shows you that it, it, it's basically possible to do that, and I think that it is a nice, uh, nice step forward to do that. Uh, okay, so where is my REST service? Oh, there it is. Doop -doo -doo. So let's try. Now I got the breakpoint. No risk, no fun. Oh, yes, here we are, let's do it again, let's see, if that breakpoint is being hit, maybe one day, uh, yeah, as before, let's wait a moment to see what happens, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, as you can see, there is a little bit room for optimizations. Um, a little bit, just a tiny little bit room for optimizations. Uh, it, w it was better with the, with the other network this morning, but yeah, whatever. Um, so the basic stuff is kind of working, but it, as you can see, it's not production ready. Uh, independent of you should not do that on the production on the production application, of course, setting a breakpoint and everybody stops there. We get millions of stops in there. Uh, we're not not that nice, but the basic stuff is working. So I will not bore you uh, with uh, with this debug thing. I will do. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, it failed. Can read some German. It's Zeitüberschreitung bei der Anforderung. Yeah, it's it's time. The, the short oh, version is. That makes total sense to me. It's it's <laughs> timeout, right? <laughs> it's a long German version for timeout. <laughs> okay, because I have so much fun with the network here, I will do a more crazy stuff uh, with the network. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be fun this evening. Um, but as you can see, it's uh, we we are trying to make it easy and allow you to, to deploy apps from within Eclipse, start, stop apps, even debug apps in the future, so that you can work within Eclipse, within your development environment. You do not have to go through Maven build and push and uh, push your apps and update apps from the command line. You can do everything within your IDE, which to me makes sense if you have this very special development space in Cloud Foundry, where you just quickly would like to try things out. So that's, uh, that's I think, great. 
Okay, so since my network is so awesome, I will do now more crazy stuff. Let's open up a new tab and do and work on the web only. That's going to be fun. Oh, that was good. Okay, so this is Eclipse Orion. That's a web IDE that's built by mostly guys from IBM uh, working on the Bluemix tooling. Um, and this is, is a cloud IDE, or at least a certain part of a cloud IDE. It's focused on uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, so it doesn't have any tooling for Java or whatever. Uh, but you can do the basic stuff just purely from the web. So what I did here is, that's my Orion workspace that's on the cloud. Uh, so you can clone a Git repository, you can commit stuff, you can, you can work with your projects, with your files. So in this case, I have a CF Hello World. This is a Node application. Uh, so you can go to your Node application, you can, you can hack your JavaScript stuff up in a, in a web editor. Uh, has pretty good, pretty good tooling in here. So even for JavaScript, there's content assist, really good content assist, not just fake stuff, a random object content assist, but real Java content assist. So it really tries to figure out what's the what's the type you're working on, uh, if you, if you can speak of a type in JavaScript. Uh, but it, it 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 tries to figure out what 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 kind of object is it, what does it have, and what 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 makes sense to provide as content assist. And, it's, it, and the Orion tooling for JavaScript is really good at that. It's all running inside the browser, and it's all implemented in JavaScript, and it's all open sourced at Eclipse. So you can take a look at that. And the Orion Hub thing, it's some kind of a playground. Right? You can just access that. You can access it with GitHub account or with a, with a Google account, I think. And you can play around with it. You can check out your own stuff and work with your own projects there. Uh, there is, of course, no guarantee, right? Everything can be lost, everything can be restarted, your workspace can be wiped out tomorrow, whatever. Uh, so there are no guarantees because it's just a playground. There is no, at least uh, as far as I know, no company doing some kind of official public hosting of an Orion environment because people try to build up their own cloud IDEs on top of Orion and offer that. That is what Eclipse is doing for Bluemix, right? They take Orion, they add some more stuff and they offer that as part of Bluemix. So you can work on your node apps from the web only. Um, but the nice thing is, uh, yes, I would like to navigate away, is that um, Orion comes with Cloud Foundry tooling out of the box. So I can put in my credentials. put in my credentials, and I can create a launch configuration, which I did already in the past. Uh, it's similar to a launch configuration in Eclipse. As, as you can see, many of the Orion guys worked on Eclipse in the past, so they are pretty used to, oh, yeah, let's create a launch config. That, that's the obvious choice for the web. Um, so uh, I created a launch configuration, and this launch configuration looks like uh, something like this. Right. Okay, the name of the launch configuration, uh, it should be deployed to my public version of Cloud Foundry uh, running at Pivotal in this organization, this development space, under this name, go. Right. And then I can just press play, which I did, and the application is being pushed and uploaded to Cloud Foundry. In the same way as the command line is doing that, same way as the Eclipse plugin is doing that, but now just from my web application, just from my web IDE. So I don't, I can access that from anywhere in the world, maybe even from an iPad, who knows. Uh, maybe I would not use the Orion UI from an iPad only, but could be could be tricky. Um, so what I can do here is uh, open up the thing, it's a high Martin, that's great, but kind of a, Let's say the, the wrong statement, so let's uh, change this. Hey, Toronto, Jock, folks. Let's save that and redeploy that application. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's part of the Eclipse Orion tooling. 
So it can be used as a platform to build your own cloud IDE if you want. Um, or you can use this playground or you can use Bluemix or, or some other people using Orion in the future. But as you can see, it's, it's already possible to implement your JavaScript app on the web only inside this cloudy IDE, getting some nice language tooling for JavaScript and HTML and pushing your app, in this case it's a Node app, to Cloud Foundry. And that's, it's updated on Cloud Foundry, which is I think quite nice. Um, as you can see, Cloud Foundry is taking care of um, choosing the right pack, the right build pack for your application. So it figures out, oh, this is a Java Spring Boot application. I will use the Java Spring Boot environment to extract everything and run it on Cloud Foundry. Oh, the, in this case, it looks at the application and says, oh, this is a Node application. I will use the Node pack for it and create a Node environment, which is, of course, totally different from a, Gi from a Spring Boot environment, right? Mm -hmm. Node environment uh, downloads Node and compiles Node and whatever. And in the other case, it, it uses a JVM and OpenJDK. Can you trick it? Sorry? Can you trick <laughs> it? Just saying that you're just terrible at organizing your project. Um, you can define the build pack yourself if you want. So you can say, okay, I deploy this app and I use this build pack, which is a git git URL. Um, so the Java build pack is open source, the node build pack is open source, and other, it's similar to Heroku, they're using build packs as well. And you can define that yourself if you want. And you can even write your own build pack if you want. So if you say, oh, I want a build pack that, does, that runs an app uh, using uh, Go, uh, with very specific environment variables, very specific settings, does this extremely specific setup on Cloud Foundry. You can write your own build pack, put that on GitHub, and whenever you push an application, you define this as a build pack, and then use that build pack on Cloud Foundry. You can do that, yeah. The, the, I think you cannot really define the underlying operating system on Cloud Foundry, because I think that's always Ubuntu Linux uh, that's being used as a baseline. Um, but everything on top, if you're installing a JDK or installing this version of JDK or whatever, you can define in the build pack. And I think there's a mechanism saying, uh, oh, automatically configure this build pack if you find X, Y, Z in the project. I think you can even do that. But I think the public hosted version knows about certain build packs. Uh, I'm not sure if you can add your own build pack for this automatic detection of the build pack. I'm not sure about that. But you can specifically define that if you push an application. Yeah. So skipping this auto detection, say, yeah, yeah, please use exactly this. So you can even, even change your Java build pack. Say, oh, yeah, I don't want to use the default Java build pack. I would like to use my own modified version of the Java build pack. Um, you fork that on GitHub. You define that when you push your application, and then you're using that build pack. And then it creates the environment. and on Cloud Foundry in the way the build pack defines it. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah? So is this um, Java build pack, like which version of the JVM is it using? <coughs> if there are multiple ones, like, is it smart enough to figure out which version of Java your project is used? I think it, I'm, n I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. I, at the moment, it uses the latest JDK version, uh, 180 underscore 40. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I think the open JDK version. Um, but I'm not sure if it detects a specific version from your application saying, oh, that's Java 7. I would just use Java 7 J JDK. I'm not sure about that. I could add, if, if you host your own Cloud Foundry, soon uh, CentOS 7 or RHEL 7 if possible. I've been working hard on that since January, so eventually. But you, you have to host it yourself then. Because Cloud Foundry is an open source project and you can deploy your own on your own equipment to pay Amazon for computer time and, and deploy there. Um, yep. And if you do that soon enough, uh, it will support Red Hat flavored Linux. Oh, cool. Great. Yeah, that, that's, an, that's another way I wanted to show you about uh, what different flavors of tooling do exist for Cloud Foundry pushing apps to Cloud Foundry, quickly getting, getting an app running on Cloud Foundry. And I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions. Otherwise, I will bore you with slides. No, no, no. <laughs> don't worry. No, no slides, except from Q&A slides. <laughs> more questions?
Otherwise, I'm here. Feel free to, to ping me. Yeah. So if you can host your own uh, instance of Cloud Foundry, do all of these tools work in that scenario as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what you do, um, for example, if you, uh, if, if you define your target, right? And your target defines which Cloud Foundry instance. In this case, it's always API run Pivotal IO. That's the endpoint for the public hosted version by Pivotal. If you would, would like to deploy your app to Bluemix, you would have to put in the API endpoint for Bluemix. If you have your own stuff running in your own data center, you need to put the URL of that instance in there. Uh, and command line tools, Eclipse plugin, Orion, that all works against <laughs> this, uh, that stuff, yeah. Okay. That's, That's kind of an official API. You can even write your own stuff uh, to, to, to push your apps to Cloud Foundry because it's all REST-based APIs that are being exposed by the platform. And you can, you can do your own stuff if you want and use the REST endpoint yourself. So have you tried targeting Bluemix, and, and if so, did it work? And if so, did IBM go, well, that's really good. Oh. <laughs> 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 you'd, like to, you'd like to help with that. Um, interestingly, the, uh, the Bluemix guys, they work together with us on the Eclipse plugin. So they're using the Eclipse plugin for, for deploying stuff or for allowing people to deploy stuff from Eclipse to Bluemix. So uh, I've never tried that myself, but I assume that they are taking care of that. <laughs> But uh, I never work with Bluemix myself. Yeah? You know if there's much difference between the uh, open source, on-premise, Cloud Foundry, and the supported Pivotal uh, on-premise Cloud Foundry? Is it the same software and its support models, or is there quite a bit of difference in the software? Do you want to you answer? Uh, yeah, I, I have. Yeah, I think I understand the difference. Um, so the, the stuff I've been working on is all the open source project, and you can deploy your entire whole Cloud Foundry from the open source projects that are hosted on GitHub. Um, the thing that you get, if, if you go to the um, like run.pivotal.io, which is the hosted version of Cloud Foundry that you can pay for uh, sort of as you use resources, you get a really nice, slick, uh, console in, in your web browser for adding extra things like adding databases and adding uh, extra services for persistence and that kind of stuff and it's just you sort of click and you can add these sort of tiles to your deployment for oh I want like a distributed Postgres database you just click on it and it goes there um, you can do all of that with the open source version by editing configuration files and deploying it yourself um, sort of like the, the underlying infrastructure, but the, the GUI that automates all of that for you is not part of the open source project. The rest of the runtime, like all of the stuff that the GUI drives is part of the open source project. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't worked with that GUI myself. I know it exists, but I, I know for sure, yeah, you can make everything go with what's in the open source project. And aren't there additional services that are available on the Pivotal Cloud Foundry yes. site that are not part of the open source project yeah. or not being being offered uh, for free on the publicly hosted version. Yes, um, additional hosted services and maybe some monitoring stuff as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Sure. And then there's also the uh, like the mobile services like push messaging and, and things like that are. Uh, those are hosted services. They're, they're not part of the open source project. Um, yeah. But as far as the de deploying stuff to the cloud and managing it, all the monitoring and management and, and scaling up and all of that is part of the open source project. Yeah. How do you declare that you need a database or uh, Oh, they're, they're two in your app? Yeah. Oh, there are two ways. Uh, one is um, you can uh, put in a manifest file into your application, uh, a YAML file. And this YAML file, you can define, for example, all the stuff that I could define from the command line or from the Eclipse plugin. Say, I would like to have five instances of this application running under this URL with this memory setting, whatever. You can put all of that stuff into a YAML file. And in that YAML file, you can also say, OK, this app needs a MySQL database of this service plan. Uh, this needs a, a Redis service, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that if when you deploy the app to Cloud Foundry, it's 
knows, oh, there's a, there's a manifest file. I need to connect this app to those five services, for example. And then it gets hooked up to those services. Um, and for if you're running a, a Spring application, there is some kind of uh, a magic, magic piece for Spring included in Cloud Foundry, or in the, in the I think in the Java build pack, um, that reconfigures your Spring application, puts the right properties into your Spring application to connect to the database automatically for you, for example, because you have this username and password or whatever for the database, usually done with properties, whatever. You could access that yourself uh, by using environment variables, things like that. But there is this magic piece for Spring that does that automatically if it detects a Spring application, which is uh, in addition to the Spring application context mechanism uh, for auto configuration. And that, that's nice, but it's, uh, it's a tiny little addition to Spring, uh, Spring specific, of course. Otherwise, you could just uh, uh, browse through the information from the command line what the service is offering for you, like uh, username is passwords. Um, and uh, hook that up yourself if you want to put the right connection parameters into your application or read out environment variables. That's also possible. But the easiest way is to do the YAML, fi the YAML file, the manifest, defining everything for the for the uh, connections there, for the for the services. I think I have one here. Doesn't contain anything about services, but at least the basic stuff is in there. Cool. You could uh, maybe show us more about how you used um, ngrok to open the debug portal. Oh. Because we actually had a presentation here a few months ago about mm -hmm. how ngrok is a great tool for doing stuff like that. Oh. It's like an application. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we are using Ngrok for this, for this, uh, for this uh, proxying out the debug around the Cloud Foundry boundary back to your uh, Eclipse debugger. Um, I can show you how, how that is done, basically. <coughs> So in my application, that's the only piece I need to do for my application to enable debugging on Cloud Foundry. I need to put in this magic.profile.d folder. Don't ask me why it's called that way. It has to be exactly that way. Uh, and in there, there's the ngrok Linux executable and the shell script, starting up ngrok, connecting it to the debug port and proxying it outside with a, with a token, with an Angrok token. So you have to have an Angrok account, like an account at Angrok, you get a token, you put the token in, into this, this shell script here saying, okay, please proxy this application's debug port from the JVM out to this Angrok token. Um, and if this is inside your application, the plugin detects that automatically for you. So once you deploy the app, it adds debug options to the JVM. And uh, if you press connect, it can connect to the right Ngrok channel for that. So you guys are going to push this into the platform? Like you have a third party right now? Um, the, the support of the, so there, is, there are no changes inside of Cloud Foundry itself necessary for doing that. Right, today. Right? Yeah. Today. Because you're using a third party to do the proxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's slow or whatever. There are, uh, there are versions of Cloud Foundry that are being worked on that allow you to do this kind of this SSH tunneling directly. And once that is available, we can replace this with a, with a new version, yeah. Which would be more, much more, better. Yeah, much better, yeah. Uh, maybe there are other options in between, like moving Ang the Angrok server more onto the, the, the Cloud Foundry sites, having Angrok more or less a side of the application running on Cloud Foundry somewhere, so you don't have to go to the public version of Angrok somewhere in the world and then go back to you, which is really slow, as you've seen. Um, so that would be kind of an intermediate step to improve that. Um, yeah, but that, that was a very kind of straightforward, hacky way to use Angrok for proxying out the debug port. 
it's a good hack for any sandbox that you find yourself <laughs> stuck in. <laughs> yeah, put Angular again and. Yep. Okay. Think I'm done. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay, I have I have two words to get your attention, which are uh, free and beer. Okay. Whoa. Now that you're listening, Todd is going to give us a, a Toronto jug first. <laughs> a Toronto jug first, which is an ignite talk. Todd is going to give us how many slides? Uh, Twenty slides. Twenty slides in. Five minutes. Five minutes. They're going to. seconds of slide. They're going to advance on their own, so uh, watch out. Yeah. And uh, this is great. If anybody thinks this is fun, I think this is fun. Uh, do an ignite talk next month. Uh, just let us know. Post to the list. Send us an email. And uh, I think this is going to be the beginning of a great thing at Toronto Jug. Yeah. After Todd is done. There's going to be seven pitchers of free beer courtesy of Pivotal on the other side of that curtain. So, so, so go over there after, but, but enjoy this first. Well, you won't, you won't, yeah, you won't be able to get rid of me now. <laughs> All right, so uh, my name's Todd Burgess. I mostly do uh, an Android development related to, uh, you know, in Java, mostly dealing with actually social media at the time, so this is what it's about. Basically, this whole thing's going to be five minutes, which means it's either going to be the best five minutes of T-Jug, or if you only have to put up with me for five minutes, so hopefully, you know. <laughs> All right, here we go. Basically, uh, this is, uh, I call it personal branding for geeks, Todd Burgess. Uh, I basically branded myself as uh, Todd Burgess Media prepared. Um, there's my Twitter thing at the bottom, and there's a bit.ly link at the bottom if you want to see my slides. Uh, what's a personal brand? Your personal brand is what you're known for, and what can you provide? Are you a Java guy, Spring guy? You know something about Eclipse? You can help with whatever. Like, what are people going to look up, look up you on the uh, internet and find? Um, what, why should you care as a geek? Number one, it can help you find a new job when people start looking you up on social media. Uh, secure venture capital funding, hey, because they want to know that you uh, can do something as well. It's a great way to uh, give back to the community, especially it's a great way, you know, the uh, programming. So what are we uh, using to build a social brand? Social media, our blogs, websites, open source projects. Think of these as, you know, your, your brand is sort of a function and these are the things that will contribute uh, to, to your function. Um, building a personal brand is like hacking. What can you do that's going to get yourself noticed in a crowd? You know, there's two uh, basic ways of doing this. One is, you know, you know, things we can do like cute is uh, we're going to show you one of the things we can do like cats, kittens. Well, why are people? Why are brands? Why are people putting out cats and kittens? Because they want to get noticed. These things get attention. These are a way. Like these two kittens are from Toronto Cat Rescue and uh, were adopted uh, a month ago, but these are little things we can do to get noticed. Basically what I'm gonna get into, just five basic little things that you can do to sort of help build your brand, because I know we're all on social media, we're doing stuff, but what are we gonna do just to make ourselves that a uh, uh, little bit better? You know, um, such as, best practice number one, it's not what you're doing for yourself, but it's what you're doing for others. If, you know, instead of worrying about what am I gonna do for me, Worry about what can I do for, for other people, be it a uh, civic thing, be it a, uh, an open source project, something like that. So what are we going to do? We're going to share, praise, don't be negative, say good things about others, support other people. When somebody looks you up on Twitter, see a lot of uh, great tweets, things that are putting out uh, useful information. Show some passion for what you do in your profession. Another thing I want to say, if you can't create Curate. So if you can't sit there and say, I can't really write a, a blog about whatever, but if you see a great article about something you read on Java, share it. Something about Linux, share it. You know, maybe add a little comment to what you do on Facebook or LinkedIn. You know, basically what you're looking to do is be known as the, uh, as the answer person. You know, share the stuff that, that you find on the, uh, the, the internet because people want to see that uh, you're out there, you're looking at stuff. You know, this is your way of saying, you know, that you're doing stuff as well. Get your code out there. Support the software community. Like, you know, yeah, it's, you know, if you can do some form of a project, you know, be it contributing to an open source project 
or writing your own, do something like that. You know, for instance, participate in open source projects. Make your own open source project. Publish your code on GitHub. Put something on the uh, the Android Play Store. These are the things that are going to say to you know anybody that yeah you care. You're out there. You're trying to give back. You're you're not just somebody who's looking to uh, collect a paycheck. Connect your social networks. Share across networks. If you're uh, looking at uh, if you write if you find a great article on uh, something new with Java, share it on your LinkedIn profile. So when somebody looks you up on LinkedIn. They're going to say, "Oh, here's somebody who seems to be doing a lot of a lot of uh, re reading about Java." Basically, you know, you're cross promoting your social social media activities. If you put something out on your LinkedIn, there is an ability to share it on Twitter because that way, now instead of creating LinkedIn content, you're also creating, uh, you know, your tw your Twitter content. Take it, you know, take advantage of, uh, you know, networks and apps' ability to, uh, you know, cr cross cross promote your. Uh, your content, because as I said, you know, it's there. A lot of these networks want to talk to each other. You know, as well, best practice number five. It seems kind of silly, but use hashtags where they're allowed and use them wisely. You know, there are, if you want to look up, certain hashtags are getting more traction, more attention than other hashtags. Use those hashtags. Don't use silly hashtags that no, nobody's going to look for. Find those hashtags that are getting their attention. You can measure your social media. Use tools like, for instance, a tool called Cloud that can measure your engagement and influence. A high, Cloud score can help you find better jobs, especially in the valley. They do look up your cloud score, which is they quite often are going to use your uh, your Twitter IT. Monitor your cloud score on Android. There's a great tool out there called What's My App on the Google Play Store. <laughs> Oddly enough, I'm the developer, but that's really you know, so I'm a little biased here in promoting it. But these are just you know one of the things I do. Like there's a you know sort of one of the app. There's a uh, Google Wear uh, thing. Basically, in conclusion, your brand is what enables people to know what you can deliver on. Most of us probably want to do move up in our jobs. We want to be, uh, you know, we want to look for better jobs. And this is just one way by uh, being smart about our social media. You know, we can, we can show to people where uh, we'll deliver on what we say we can. Thank you. Awesome.